But again, to continue our series that we're doing on suffering, I'm going to ask you to turn this morning with me, please. We're going to look at one verse of scripture in our Bibles. The rest we'll see on the screen to Romans, the eighth chapter, Romans chapter eight. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much this morning, God, for your awesome salvation provided by your Son. Indeed, God, you are the greatest giver of all times. And God, indeed, your Son is the greatest gift of all times. And God, we receive him gladly into our lives. God, we look to him. We, God, bless you for him. We're thankful for him, God. And God, he is our means, our strength, our everything. And God, as we look again to your word this morning, I pray that God, Jesus, will come through it beautifully. Father, please help us, God, always to glorify him and depend upon him for everything. Bless us richly this morning, God, through your son and in his name we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we ask it. Yes. Amen. Amen. You know, a lot of people believe that their whole life was all prearranged. Therefore, whatever takes place was planned. So when something occurs, they call it fate or the providence of God. But listen, God doesn't want credit for the mess we've made of our lives. Nor does he want to be blamed for it. If indeed he controlled everything, all of our lives would be perfect. Remember, after he created the world, everything was perfect. It wasn't until man sinned that all became imperfect. So it's not fate that determines everything. But a world of people left to themselves, stumbling along in their sins. However, while things that happen in our life are always part of God's plan, he has promised to make them work for our good. For which reason Paul could say in Romans 8, 28, look at it please, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, brother, let's face it, only God could keep a promise like that. And only for Christians does he keep it. Everything that occurs in our life, good or bad, he turns it into a benefit for us. And, brethren, that includes every sorrow, sickness, trial, and tear that we shed. And one of the ways he makes them work for our good, well, God doesn't purpose everything. He finds a purpose for everything. Now, we're going to see an example of this in James chapter 1. Ronnie, could you put those verses on the screen? My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. You know, somebody one time said that a brook would lose its song if God remove the rocks and so it is with our trials if God were to simply remove them all of the benefits they alone could provide would probably be lost so again he finds a purpose for them and makes them useful useful okay there's a number of things we can learn from this passage for example we're told here notice please to count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations or into various trials Bonds noted, there is something in religion to sustain the soul which the world does not possess. And how true that is. While the lost curse God for their trials, God's children always find something in theirs to praise God for. Also, it's strongly indicated here, notice please by the routine mention of falling into divers' temptations. That the more trials we pass through, the better prepared we'll be for the many more that are coming. And also, what God is showing us in these verses is this. It's not our trial that should concern us the most, but how we are managing it. So he tells us here that after the trying of your faith works patience, to let patience during our trials have a perfect work. Because most trials don't come to stay. They come and then pass. And when they do, look at how they leave us. Perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Which proves again that more real good can be produced by trials than when all is going well. You know, Martin Luther had a very interesting assessment of all of this. Regarding the effects that trials have on us, listen to what he wrote. 
Whatever tribulation finds in us, it develops more fully. If anyone is carnal, weak, blind, and wicked, tribulation will make him more carnal, weak, blind, and wicked. On the other hand, if one is spiritual, strong, wise, pious, gentle, and humble, he will become more spiritual, powerful, wise, pious, gentle, and humble. As the psalmist says, thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Tribulation, he says, does not make people impatient, but proves that they are impatient. So everyone may learn from tribulation how his heart is constituted. So how can we know if our trial is bigger than we are, or if we're bigger than it? According to Martin Luther, after it passes, are we left a better person because of it, or a worse person? All right, while trials, as we've seen, are used to improve us, some of them are meant to frankly correct us. Now, these can be seen in Hebrews 12, 11. Speaking of God's chastening, we're told, and Ronnie, could you put this on the screen, please? Now, no chastening or disciplining for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Folks, we're wise when we realize that though we are living in very difficult times, not all of the pressures we're feeling are coming from the world. Some of them may be coming from Jesus, who's correcting us, reproving us, and doing whatever he has to, to make us ready for his coming. And brethren, how much could be avoided if we would just mend our ways? So if you're sinning, stop it. If you're bitter, get over it. If you're slothful, get moving. Let God's chastening do what it says it can do here. Yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. And it will. It will. Look at some of the fine results of God's chastening. The psalmist confessed in Psalm 119.67. Ronnie, I'll just give you a name, Ronnie, and that way you can just flash it on the screen. <laughs> Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. So what did God's chastening accomplish here? It took a man who was running from God and returned him to God. From going astray to keeping God's word. Look at Psalm 119.71, Ronnie. It is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. Which again is proof positive that while God's chastening may be grievous, the fruits it produces are priceless. Here it took a man from an ignorance of God's statutes to a knowledge of them. And notice, please, how we saw this knowledge as the purpose for his trial and also as the very thing he needed. Brethren, wherever we are in this life, we're always wiser when we realize where we should be. Okay, let's look at another scriptural teaching on trials and suffering. In 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9, Paul said this, Ronnie. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Now, brother, how could Paul be so positive in such negative situations? Because he knew that when you take into account all that God has given to us, from salvation to everlasting life, and then on the other side of the scale, where your trials and your losses, our total situation in life, is never worse than it is wonderful. Now this he confirms again in verses 16 to 18 of the same chapter. Ronnie. For which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish. Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction which is but for a moment. Worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. When we look not at the things which are seen. But at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Brother, do you know what verses like this prove? By the means of a trial, God isn't trying to destroy us, but to demonstrate that those he saves are indestructible. We see that here. Though our outward man perish as he will, whether we're saved or lost, yet the inward man is renewed or made new day by day. So while the one is fading, the other is flourishing. Look again at verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Now, how could we possibly see things that are not seen? 
Listen, while every crowd is shrouded in darkness, in a symbolic sense, a beam of spiritual light is shining down on that trial that enables us to see what eternity will be ours for our moments of suffering now, and then to be encouraged by it. Which kind of raises a question. If our circumstances are down, should we be down? I mean, should we act the way we feel as many Christians do? No. According to verse 16, we're to faint not. Instead, we'd see our trial as momentary, and also notice as light. See it there in verse 17, our light affliction, which is but for a moment. Therefore, since that all our trial is, according to God's word, that we're to rejoice and not be discouraged in all of our tribulation. A man who went through some great physical trials that finally wrote about his death said this just before he died. I never would have chosen one of the trials that I've gone through, but I wouldn't have missed any of them for the world. Now, why did he say that? Because he had obviously learned that when things went wrong, it was always for the right reason. Naturally, since God is good, then all he deems right for our life is good, including our trials. All right, let's counter a heresy for a moment here. There are numerous Christians who believe that God only desires to bless and to prosper his people. In fact, they consider it strange, almost abnormal, to find you sick or being tried. However, look at what 1 Peter 4 tells us. Ronnie, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, he may be glad also with exceeding joy. Now, did you notice the future tense in the language of verse number 12? It didn't speak of a trial that has tried you, but of the fiery trial which is to try you, which is God's assurance that more trials are coming and that they'll all be a normal part of our life. In fact, they are so normal, a case could be made for the fact that they're a vital part of our life because those who suffer the most across the board almost always become the strongest and really the finest of Christians. Now, in view of that, look at what James 1.12 tells us. Ronnie, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, which here speaks of suffering and trials. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Now, remember, a trial removed can't be overcome. So God not only allows them, he expects us to endure them. And brother, we can. With Christ in us. We can outlast and survive every trial and testing we're faced with. Now look at our reward for this. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. So again, what's momentary achieves what's everlasting. And notice, please, who especially will receive this crown, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. And brethren, what a key to spiritual success that little statement is. For our part in salvation, nothing makes us more obedient, more durable, and ultimately more victorious than a genuine love for God. All right. Look at this marvelous conclusion that Paul draws in Romans 8.18. Ronnie? For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, look at this now, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So after Paul concluded all of our sufferings present, or I should say considered all of our sufferings presently, and then all of the glory that is yet to be ours, what was the result? He tells us they weren't worthy to be compared. The glory had far outweighed the suffering. And remember, this was all written under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit. So it's very safe to say, figuratively speaking now, that the worst things that we can go through in this life amount to nothing more than a little bruising. That being the case, look at what Paul wrote in Philippians 4.11. Ronnie, I have learned in whatsoever state I am, look at this, therewith to be content. Brother, isn't it great to know that while God doesn't want us and our enjoyments to come from the same source as the lost get theirs, he nevertheless sees to it that we are more content than they are, even in our trials. All right, here's a reason for suffering that we seldom consider. 
And to help us to recognize it when it occurs, I want to put two verses on the screen that aren't related. Ronnie, would you put them on the screen, please? Concerning Lazarus who was sick, Jesus said this in John 11, 4. This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. And Ruth 3, 18, sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall. Now, as we've seen in these studies, God may use suffering to chastise us, to increase our faith, to better our character, or for some other reason. But if we can't find a reason for our trial, and we just sit still and wait, we might find that our suffering is simply for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Maybe he wants the attention of our unsaved family as he performs the miraculous in us, which means... That's no time to fail, is it? To become depressed, bitter, or complain. Remember, Proverbs 24.10 tells us, Ronnie, could you put that on the screen? If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. How we handle the crisis will always demonstrate how strong or how weak we are. Right, as we're all aware, God isn't only conscious of all of his children, but also of every detail in their life. So when it comes to our trials and afflictions, look at what 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4 tell us, Ronnie. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation. Consider this, please. Wouldn't God who provided all we would need for this life have also included a solution to all of our troubles? Well, they did. And we find it here. His personal comfort in all our tribulation. Which is his ability, not only to console us in a trial, but to also encourage us in it, strengthen us in it, and to ultimately get us through it. And also, as we saw last week with Job, to make us a better person because of our trial. How beautiful is that? You know, if your child is hurting... You'll drop everything to help them. Why? Because when they're hurting, you hurt. Well, isn't it encouraging to know that a heavenly father is that sensitive to our hurts and is quick to administer his comfort? And listen, in ways and in the lives we're not even aware of. I read a remarkable story recently. Listen to it, please. There was an atheist couple who had a child. The couple never told their daughter anything about the Lord. One night when the little girl was five years old, the, far- the parents fought with each other and the dad shot the mom right in front of the child. Then the dad shot himself. The little girl watched it all. She then was sent to a foster home. The foster mother was a Christian and took the child to church. On the first day of Sunday school, the foster mother told the teacher that the girl had never heard of Jesus and to please have patience with her. During class... The teacher held up a picture of Jesus and said, does anybody know who this is? The little girl said, I do. That's the man who held me in his arms the night my parents died. You know, the psalmist tells us that God is a very present help in trouble. Which means he's not just present, he's very present. Making him very aware of our troubles. Very quick to bring comfort. And very certain to be sure that nothing goes too far. In fact, look at these wonderful promises of God's nearness to us. Of his nearness to us. Ronnie, could you put these on the screen? Look at these, please. Psalm 34, 18. It tells us that the Lord is nigh unto them. Look at this, please. This is a promise that are of a broken heart. In Jeremiah 23, 23, God asks, Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Because he is at hand. Jesus could say in John 14, 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Brethren, Jesus is always joining himself with those who are hurting. We never ever go it alone. That's why David could say with all confidence in Psalm 16, 8, Ronnie, please. Because the Lord is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. I shall not be moved. I want to conclude with a little testimony. In his Bible, an elderly minister carried a bookmark that was made of silk threads woven into a motto. At the back of the bookmark was a tangled web of crossed threads that seemed to be without reason or purpose. 
When the minister visited the home or hospital room where there was great trouble, sorrow, or death, he would frequently show the bookmark, first presenting the reverse side with all of its unintelligible tangle. When the distressed one had examined it intently without finding any meaning to the seeming disorder, the minister would ask him to turn the fabric over immediately. Against a white silk background, there appeared a phrase in colored threads, God is love. That side made sense. It had order, it had meaning. And so it is in life. We often experience events that seem to be without explanation or meaning, like a maze of tangled threads. But when we are face to face with Jesus, face to face with Jesus, and can view our life from eternity, we will see that every detail, good and bad, pleasant and unpleasant, was woven together to show us that indeed God is love. God is love. Brethren, is there anything more important in our life than looking to Jesus and including him in our life to a full extent, to that full extent, so that we can say as did David, and I want to read that verse again because God is at my right hand. Look at that. This is a promise. I shall not be moved. I shall not be moved. What a promise. What a gift God is there at our right hand, promising because he is, we won't be moved. We won't be moved. In all of our trials and all our tribulations, look this morning at one of the most gripping stories in all of God's word. It's found in the book of Job, chapter 1. Would you turn